one thing that I have looked back on as I was doing research and reading about evolution of C-suite roles. I looked at the evolution of the CFO role and the CFO role wasn't a role until the early 1980s. It became a thing because of regulations and, and government and risk mitigation. There's a parallel, I think, between the, the data officer role and the financial officer role because it went from risk mitigation to monetization. You see CFOs working very closely with chief revenue officers and things like that about strategic go-to-market, et cetera. And I think you're seeing the same thing with the CDO. It's gone from stewarding and protecting data to monetization of data. Welcome to The Data Chief. The Data Chief is a podcast for data and analytics leaders to share their personal stories and insights on technology, culture, and leadership. As data and insights become more important to business success, it makes sense that the office of a chief data officer has evolved as well. It's gone from a defensive role focused on stewardship and data production to an offensive role focused on monetization and creating strategic value. Our guest today, Heidi Lanford, CDO of Fitch Group, is seeing that evolution firsthand. She shares with us how CDOs can build effective partnerships with their executive counterparts with clear focus and communication. She also shares why there can be considerable career value in choosing to be uncomfortable, how she builds diversity into her team, and best practices for improving data literacy. The Data Chief is presented by our friends at ThoughtSpot, the modern analytics cloud company. ThoughtSpot makes it easy for anyone to analyze your company's data with search and AI. Business people from companies like Walmart, Hulu, Schneider Electric, Cloud Academy, and Mercado use ThoughtSpot to quickly uncover new insights and turn them into action. You can learn more at ThoughtSpot.com. Heidi, welcome to The Data Chief. I am so honored to be here, Cindy. Thank you for having me. Yeah, well, I have been really excited about this one. Um, and I often like to start with, while we're traveling vicariously around the world through everyone, where are you joining us from today, Heidi? So today I am joining you from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, uh, though uh, in about two weeks, I am going to be relocating to New York City and I'll be bouncing back between North Carolina and New York. Oh, great. So really in my backyard. Uh, can't wait to have you up here. And I take it part of this move is part of your new role at Fitch, Com Fitch Group coming up on just over a year or almost a year and a half now. Is that about right? That's about right. Yes, I joined Fitch at the end of 2020. I was a what they call a pandemic hire, I guess. I did my entire interviewing process via numerous Zoom calls. And um, I was joking with, um, with my boss that he was, I think, taking a trip down 95 to go to Florida for a month and, you know, suggested that maybe we meet in a Target parking lot somewhere along 95 to actually finally meet face to face. I actually didn't meet anybody until it was probably four months into my job when I met someone face to face. Wow. And so this is what has become of the executive team interviews. They're in a parking lot <laughs> or over <laughs> over Zoom. I know that 95 corridor uh, from New York down to Florida. So uh, Heidi, you, you've been in the analytics space for years. But I also think this role at Fitch is very reflective of the transition of the chief data officer truly sitting on the leadership team at Fitch. Tell us a little bit about that. So I, it actually, you know, it's, it was part of the leadership team when I joined at the end of 2020. Um, but interestingly, um, I had an opportunity within um, probably the first eight months to then report directly to the CEO. So I report to the CEO now, and I was reporting to the chief operating officer uh, when I joined. And, you know, it was, um, you know, a, just a great 
set of events that happened. The COO um, whom I was working for was also the CFO, and he got promoted to be the president of one of our divisions. And so data is such an important thing for us at Fitch because it is our product. Our product is based on foundational data, and it informs everything we do in terms of research that we publish as well. So we sell data, we sell research. And and so now I, I get the opportunity to be um, one of those CDOs that is focused on data as a product and, and truly the monetization of that, which I think is something that lots of CDOs sort of aspire to be able to, you know, play in that space um, in addition to supporting, you know, the operational data that informs our business and helps run our business, you know, more effectively and efficiently. And so that's honestly was the the number one thing that excited me and drew me to the job at Fitch was it data is our product and, you know, no better way to help influence that. Yeah. Yeah. So for those who are not maybe coming from financial services or less familiar with Fitch, Um, describe it a little more. I mean, I would, I would think of it within the family of credit agencies like S and P Moody's, but it's more comprehensive than that. So how would you describe it? Sure. So, you know, we are, um, what I guess we call one of the big three credit ratings agencies and, um, we are an over hundred year old company and we are owned by Hearst Corporation. Um, and what we do is um, we, you know, we produce and publish data and information, you know, on um, the basically the, you know, the risk associated with various things that we're rating, entities that we rate. And we run the gamut from, you know, looking at structured finance to um, sovereigns, you know, governments, etc., cetera, the, the public sector, as well as corporations, both, both public and private. And um, we produce, you know, actual raw, raw data on, on that, as well as a myriad of publications and opinions and reports um, to our customers that they can, you know, then use that information to ascertain um, risk, essentially. Yeah, so data really is your business. How much do you think that influenced that the CDO really is part of the executive team? And if you think back some of the organizations that you've worked with before, so coming from Red Hat, for example, or even other industries, the CDO is often reporting into the CIO or maybe a COO. So how much of this actually being part of the C-suite is because data is a product at the Fitch Group? You know, I think I think that is part of it. Um, I think it's a large part of it because it is so important. Um, so I think of it like, you know, if you use a, a kitchen analogy, I mean, it is the it is the raw the raw ingredients to what we're making and producing. And if that isn't of pristine quality, if it isn't, if we don't have enough of those ingredients available in the kitchen, and if we don't have the tools available, then it either slows down our, our product development, you know, new, new items that we can create and make. And um, we would have dissatisfied customers if, if it's not of pristine quality. And so it it traverses all parts of our organization. And because of that, I think there's been this evolution and recognition, you know, particularly in Fitch, that it is um, almost, you know, the skill sets needed to do this are so unique and different than what we have in, say, IT or in our operations, yet everybody uses data. But how can we put an emphasis on the talent that we're developing on the budget and the funding that we have for this and make it distinct and separate yet tied into supporting the rest of the organization. In my last job, um, as you mentioned, at Red Hat, you know, I was reporting into um, the CIO and 
though it's a technology, you know, first focus, um, being part of the, the CIO and IT organization, there are lots of synergies between, you know, data and technology. Um, but I think that the, the data office role has really evolved. And one thing, you know, that I, I look, have looked back on as I was, you know, doing research and reading about, you know, sort of evolution of C-suite roles. I looked at the, um, the evolution of the CFO role and the CFO role actually didn't really, it wasn't a role until the early 1980s. It became a thing um, because of regulations and, and yeah. government and risk mitigation. Yeah. So there's a parallel, I think, between the, the data officer role and the financial officer role because it went from risk mitigation to monetization. I mean, you see CFOs working very closely with chief revenue officers and things like that about, you know, strategic go to market, etc. And I think you're seeing the same thing with the CDO. It's gone from stewarding and protecting data to monetization of data. Yeah, that offensive um, now is what you want in a CDO rather than those first generation CDOs really defensive, just guarding the data, let's say. But you also referred to the unique skills in this role. How do you partner with your CEO and uh, the COO to make sure that the data really is helping drive the business strategy or execute the business strategy? It is, um, it is an evolution in how those conversations evolve and um, become, I think, you know, almost like a, uh, you know, Batman and Robin type partnership. Um, I've, I've, seen, I've seen articles that have referred to, you know, the bucket and the water and the CIOs, you know, the bucket and the CDOs, the water, or, you know, like the Batman and Robin, although you could, you know, I don't yeah. want to argue who's Batman and who's Robin. <laughs> I'm going to debate like who's that, even but... stronger. Yeah. I'm not sure who's stronger. Right. One person gets more of the glory, but um, yeah. So, but you know, it's, it re really, it truly needs to be a partnership. You know, I, I think that, you know, as an example, um, our, CTO organization owns and needs to be driving our hybrid cloud strategy or our, you know, full cloud strategy. It doesn't matter to me um, uh, what what we're using for our cloud cloud technologies. Um, do I want to be sure that the CTO organization understands our data needs and how we need to access data and the, the timeliness um, and the organization of that and, and hand those requirements over and work in, in concert with the CTO to um, ensure that we have the best platform for that. Absolutely. And so that's where, you know, as an example, we're, we're focusing on the data platform and what technology we need for the data platform, but whether it's you know AWS or Google or Microsoft, I I value their knowledge and partnership, and so that's sort of how we've we've you know tried to I guess you know divvy things up in a way, but work in concert. Um, so what would go in a data lake? We work with the business on determining that what that data lake you know, looks like what, what brand it is. Um, they, they own that, that part. Okay. So you're more on the why and the value side, and they're more on the how the detailed, how from an infrastructure side or cloud platforms, um, deciding that now, now given that, uh, your business is data, if you think about the listeners out there trying to communicate with their CEOs the importance of data, how do you break that down? You've, you've written a little bit about thinking about big rocks rather than getting too mired in some of the techno babble that um, CEOs might not care about. Can you tell us a little bit about that? 
I, I can. It's um, so the big rocks. It's, it's actually become, I think, a little, little bit of a, a fun um, joke, but it's it's been it's caught on in our company. You know, I go back to um, my dad always used to tell me, um, don't become a jack of all trades and master of nothing. Um, that has stuck with me since probably I was flitting from sport to sport or hobby to hobby when I was in elementary school. And, you know, I, I think what, what my, my dad's advice um, is true for corporate America. We need to focus on a few things and do them really well and not try to do a lot of things just sort of half-baked. And an example of that in the data space um, would be, you know, one of great example. Uh, we just this past week, our data governance organization approved, and it's a cross-functional, you know, reps from every department in the company. We approved um, a standard way of how we look at country to subregion to region. So, you know, is Mexico part of Latin America or Central America or North America? North America. And we're, yeah. we're adopting the UN mappings. Now, that's great to have everybody agree on that, but then what does it mean to make that actually come to life and have it affect how people are, you know, looking at their data, performing their day job, developing a marketing campaign, rating a particular entity and being able to classify it and, and use the right comparables in the right region that they're they're performing a rating in, for example. Um, we need help ensuring that our customers have such a great experience and that our data and outputs are of top quality. And something that might seem small, like a country to region mapping, it, it actually does really affect our customers' experience on our platform. And so while that might not be a big rock, it does feed into um, the quality of our data. And so having a conversation like that, which is something we're going to be having next week with our CEO and the president of one of our divisions on what does it mean now that we approve this, who's going to help do all the work to make this actually come to life? And that, I think, is one of the biggest roles that a CDO has to advocate for in the C-suite is to be able to explain in plain language what it means for a data policy or, you know, a new data platform to actually come to life and make an impact to the organization, because otherwise it's just techno speak and yeah. they don't understand it. Yeah, I can imagine the conversation would be very different if you said to the CEO, we have to clean up our country master data. <laughs> uh, what does that mean? Um, what does that even mean? So so phrasing it as you've done on how it's serving the customers um, and the way you would analyze data is, is very different. So is, is this a learned skill, do you think, for... CDOs, or I'm thinking of your background and your journey to this role. So many, many years ago, you started as a consultant at PwC. Um, you actually had your own marketing analytics business. So has this been really your journey of um, really being consultative and learning to speak the language in a way that your key business stakeholders will understand it? I think so, Cindy. I, I really believe that um, my experience as a programmer, a data analyst, a data scientist has positioned you know, me uniquely to really advocate um, for how people are using and interacting with data. And I get all of those pain points. I've, I've, I've been shadow IT before because I, you know, I couldn't get as a data scientist, I couldn't get the data that I needed. So built my own database and had the copy and I, I get it. I get why those things happen and occur in companies. And I want to do my best to provide um, options and tools and experiences for our customers, for our 
credit ratings analysts so that they get what they need and they make it data is, you know, easy to access and it's just, it's just not hard anymore. Yes. And we will always aspire to that, you know? Yeah. So you have that empathy for the actual um, business person or users, your credit analysts. I don't know if you realize my start was also in shadow IT and the business loved me. <laughs> and then I moved over to IT and overnight the business hated me. I'm like, what's up with that? Um, <laughs> but it's, you described this collaboration and partnership between the technology organization and let's say data and analytics. The IT workforce is often a critical part of standing up um, and, and increasingly as we go to cloud, it's maybe not standing up, but, but selecting the technology stack. How do you partner to ensure that you're modernizing your technology stack, but also upskilling the workforce to leverage these new innovations? We have really been, I think, pushing um, the training of our IT professionals to use and consume sort of more modern data platform technology. Um, I'm funding training for the for you know our data engineers in the IT organization to help with that migration and upskilling. Um, I think it's a combination of um, you know doing that development work internally as well as bringing in some outside people, especially in different industries to give a, a multi-industry perspective for how data can be used. So one of the things I've been trying to do as I've been building out my team since this, I've, I have a new organization is um, balancing the staff um, with financial services, you know, some credit ratings agency experience, banking, um, investment banking, etc., as well as even CPG software, you know, you name it. And, and I'm really trying to bring that diversity to the organization that I'm building. In addition to us, you know, building out these training programs for the technology folks who do report into my organization, as well as those that report into the CTO organization. Yeah, so that cross-pollination, I think, is important when you're innovating um, and the modern data stack is changing so quickly. Now, some would say, well, why bring in somebody from CPG into financial services? What's your thinking for that? Um, well, a couple things. In some cases, um, they might be dealing with uh, volumes of data that are significantly greater than ours. So, you know, while some financial services companies deal with transaction based, you know, like a credit card company, they're dealing with, you know, petabytes of data, lots and lots of transactions. We don't have that volume um, or that um, recency quite, you know, quite as recency requirement. But uh, if we're thinking into the future of what we need to be doing and how that technology needs to evolve and, and adapt. I want that kind of thinking. I don't want to over-engineer. I'm not saying like, you know, build the, the Maserati when really we just need the Cadillac or, you know, a good Honda, but we do need to push the envelope a little bit. And in some cases, you know, um, some areas of financial services aren't quite as modern as say software technology yes. etc and and we're not a digital native company so remember Fitch is over 100 years old and so we've got a lot of transformation work to do on the technology side to bring us forward um, into you know modern times and that's it's a big transformation journey that we're on so I look for people who have um, been in that, journey before or have built something that is very different from what we have so that we have that perspective. Yeah, it's an interesting dichotomy in a way. If you think uh, financial services historically more analytically mature, 
um, better at data and analytics, lots of data, but then slow to modernize to the cloud. It's, uh, it's, um, why do you think that is? Lots of data, lots yes. of data, lots of Excel spreadsheets. Oh no. <laughs> A lot of Excel. Um, why is that? You know, um, I think part, part of it is, um, I think you're seeing, I think you're seeing a shift generationally. So one of the things, you know, that I've noticed is the number of courses that are offered in undergraduate, even humanities type, um, degrees that focus on data science or intro to statistics or data visualization even. And, you know, certainly we could talk about for a whole hour, the data literacy evolution that's happening, but I am seeing more emphasis in universities on, on those skill sets. And that I think is affecting a shift in terms of the skill sets and the tools that people coming out of school or within the past five years, let's say, um, are expecting in in the workplace. So I think we're seeing that shift. Um, I also, you know, to, to really answer your question though, why why has financial services been a little bit behind on the on the technology platform side of things? It's also um, sometimes kind of gets back to our our shadow IT discussion. Sometimes it's just easier to get that data download it into a spreadsheet and do what you want with it and then quickly get that out because if you're you know an investment banker you're supporting you know a deal and there's de there's deadlines constant deadlines um, for producing analysis making decisions getting things out um, you know to people to review or to customers and I, I think it's just been easier and so now we're finding in the era of self-service it's changing right yeah, so maybe it was easier in that moment, but is it easier when you're doing it month after month or week after week? Um, and you think about these analysts that spend nights and weekends preparing a beautiful PowerPoint deck that is out of date as soon as it's published. So is it easier over the long run or just in that moment? I think just in that moment, because then, and I think we've, we've realized this, and this is why, you know, we're funding a data organization and new technology is there's lots of good stuff in those one-offs that people have been doing. And how do we harness that? Well, if they're resident on everyone's laptop or in a SharePoint file folder, you know, it's really hard to mine that data and build new products. And hence, that's where I think, you know, my role um, comes in to basically offer that data innovation lab for the company to rapidly build new products and not have to wait three months, six months, nine months to put automation around them and standardize them and get them into a data warehouse or a data lake and then build the pipes to funnel it out to our platform for customers. Like we want to cut that down. The way we have to cut that down though, is that it's almost like, you know, going back to the kitchen analogy, we need that prep kitchen right next to the production kitchen, because if we come up with a great new entree, we don't want to have to wait. We want to just go, right into that production kitchen and make it and serve it and start monetizing it. So that's, that's the challenge um, that we have. Yeah. Yeah. So that's actually bringing the concepts of agile and squads, getting this collaboration much, much tighter in order to make that happen though. You also referred to having a more data literate workforce. And I know you have been one of the data literacy pioneers practicing some of these things, driving a more data literate workforce, going back to Red Hat. Tell us um, what, what are your tools of the trade or best practices as you try to improve data literacy at Fitch? I, um, 
I love I love the the pioneering concept um, with with the data lodge. In fact, I've I've joked with the data lodge founder Valerie Logan that we all need to get our bonnets on, you know, like Little House on the Prairie. Um, it just it always conjures <laughs> up that that image for me. Laura Ingalls Wilder, um, you know, it it's and I think a lot of your guests, Cindy, on on your podcast series talk about storytelling and buy-in and things like that. And and to kind of preach this ad nauseum, it, it really is important and true. So an example, you know, in my last role, I would say we, um, we had the need to provide uh, a cohesive central platform for an executive dashboard to get everyone on the same page, singing from the same, you know, hymn book and being able to make decisions based on, you know, some data, data being a, you know, maybe a data first sort of input to the decision making. Uh, We got a cross-functional team together. It took us probably a good year to get people using this dashboard instead of using PowerPoint, like you mentioned earlier. One of the, one of the tricks though, I think that, that we had is our team came together and we started to add up how many hours everybody was spending putting together their respective PowerPoint decks or Excel, um, you know, workbooks for a monthly business review or a QBR. And we added up the numbers, you know, multiplied it by, I don't know, like $100 an hour, and it became like the $40,000 PowerPoint deck. And all of us, all of the leaders across the different divisions of the company started saying when executives would want that PowerPoint deck and not go to the central dashboard that we worked really hard putting together. And we would say, yeah, you really don't want the $40,000 PowerPoint deck, do you? And that, it was funny, but that little sound bite. It, it helped. We all said it over and over again, and it helped change the dynamic of influencing a more data literate C-suite in this example, because it was a, a C-suite dashboard, essentially. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's where the $40,000 to create that one PowerPoint has been hidden. Um, an executive might only see mm. the finished product. And I think of where does the industry want to get to? I think of um, a analytics leader at Western Union, for example, has spoken about how now they use live boards in their um, business meetings. So nothing is static, nothing, um, you, you can investigate things real time. But to be able to do that, you need a data literate workforce. And I think sometimes people were more comfortable with these PowerPoints or spreadsheets um, because it was almost looking at data with blinders. You can only see what's there um, and that felt safer. So how do you, who do we have to bring along here? How much is it the role of the CEO or business leaders to drive that change? Or is it the data team to drive that change? I think um, the data team is the, the cheerleader and the, the tool kit provider, but you need, you need those executives in addition to the CEO because it's not gonna mobilize if just the CDO is talking about it. Uh, right. A great example of of um, that executive sort of championing something. Um, I I know of an executive at IBM who required in her you know monthly staff meetings that everybody who attended needed to show up with an observation or a data point from you know their CMO dashboard, and and that was expected that was expected of everybody attending is that they would come with sort of that data first mindset from that source of the truth and and that's where discussions would start and and she had that expectation of her staff that to me is true you've really been successful at data literacy if if you've got executives 
you know, speaking that way and requiring that kind of behavior. Yeah, so so it looks like it has to come from both um, top down and bottom up all at the same time. Um, you you've shared at least one specific practice people can employ to reinforce the behaviors you want. I understand you also are about to launch or maybe just launched a program involving like superheroes or capes. Can you can you share some yeah. details about this? Yeah, so we um, just last month, we we have launched a Legends of Data program. And it is a um, it's a program to really recognize um, the, you know, the data, not just leaders. Um, I would say it's the data advocates and champions throughout the company. So it's not intended to be only um, members of the the data organization. It's it's open to everyone in the company. We have a nominating committee. I think we have, you know, four different um, roles that were or awards that we're going to be giving out twice a year. And you know, it's our job to build like the programming and, and excitement around this and the energy and and frankly the data culture to. I would say influence the corporate culture a little bit, um, and and yeah, so we're we're planning on you know having um, some some swag associated with this, and we have sort of adopted this kind of superhero theme. So yes, there there will be capes. Okay, I love it. You're gonna have to share a picture on social media of these <laughs> these capes and these new heroes. Um, that's so fun. So you do this, you champion this within Fitch and your previous orgs, but you also give back uh, by serving on the board of advisors at University of Virginia, their data science program. Are you seeing changes at that level that how quickly will this impact the workforce, do you think? Or are we still emphasizing more too much of the coding and not enough of the, the business acumen? Um, I think it is, uh, well, I, you know, so I am completely biased. I think the University <laughs> of Virginia's program is amazing. And it is, I, I wish it had been available when I was a student at the University of Virginia. It is a wonderful combination of um, some of the math and statistics, the data visualization aspects, um, the data engineering work, but also storytelling. And what I've also seen um, in programs like, like UVA's uh, around the country is the training of students to be able to really explain and tell the story about why this data is meaningful, what you should, what actions you can take with it, how does it impact, you know, decision making or potential decisions, and um, some of the techniques that uh, these these schools have been doing are bringing in um, actors like Im improv actors to help wow. the students with yeah. getting out of their comfort zone and being able to kind of think about things on the fly, and I mean, it's just I've seen an amazing growth in the confidence of these students um, over the course of, you know, the past five or so years that I've been that I've been serving on this board. And, and I see it, you know, I'm seeing it throughout uh, the country. There's a, more and more programs like this at universities um, than than there were, you know, five years ago where they were very relatively, you know, there just weren't many of them. Yeah, there weren't many for sure. When I was in school, there weren't any. And a lot of these emerged more in the computer science departments. And so we didn't have that versatility of skills that this role requires. You know, so you, you just made a big move um, elevating your career to the office of the CDO and changing industries going newly into financial services. So I would say this is stretching yourself. Um, how do you get comfortable with that? And what does the future look like? Uh, it is 
It is certainly stretching. It is um, not comfortable, um, but that, and I say that in a good way. Um, okay. I I seem to be drawn to um, positions that maybe offer a little bit of discomfort, and I feel that that's a a, a great way to grow. Um, you know, I I pick up things every time I I'm in a different job. There's there's just something new and there's always something positive, you know, that I think you can take from each of your positions and, and what you've learned. And they have an impact on, on who you are and, and what you're able to do. And, you know, for, for me, this is a, you know, a new subject area of data that, that I'm having to get up to speed on. And it's a, it's a multi-year journey. I mean, you know, the, the folks who do um, credit ratings analysis have been doing this training for years and, yeah. and they're experts in it. And I will never be um, able to do their job, but I want to understand, you know, enough of how they use data and what types of data they use so that I can partner with them and hopefully keep up with them. And, and in some cases be able to identify new sources of data um, and bring them to them so that it can enhance, you know, the, the new product development work that we do. And so that, that part is the biggest, I think, fun and challenge for me is to be able to get myself, uh, you know, at that, at that level, um, to be able to really partner and impact what they're doing. Yeah. So you bring the outside in perspective, you're bringing the perspective also from a tech company into financial services. But listening to you, I'm wondering, is there something in your background or maybe your upbringing that makes you seek out the hard things? Because I think about the statistics that rarely will a woman apply for a role unless they meet all the criteria. And yet you're seeking these challenges out. Well, part of it, I guess, could go back to my 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 dad's story about, you know, um, jack of all trades um, comment. But, you know, also maybe going back to the the data science programs, too, that we're seeing now. I when I went uh, to college, I started off thinking I wanted to be an engineer, um, systems engineering, and I didn't like the I would say limitations of that program in terms of being able to take elective courses. And so I transferred out of engineering and went into the College of Arts and Sciences after one semester. But I kept taking all of the computer science classes and I ended up being a math and stats major. And um, I took a lot of business school courses in addition to, you know, art history and history of jazz and religion and whatever. And that, I think, I kind of, I feel like I did sort of what I could do with a data science degree back then, even though we didn't have a data science program. And my interests have always been in application of things as opposed to um, just doing it for the sake of doing it. And so when I, you know, when I took my first job as a consultant, I loved the application of programming math statistics to, um, real problems that we were trying to solve. And I think I've just always continued to look at um, ways that I can take the things that I'm passionate about, you know, statistics, good data analysis, easy to access data, high quality data, um, to solving real problems. And, you know, Fitch is a, a, you know, a new, was a new industry for me. And it's, you know, a new set of problems because we're trying to build uh, new products and get them to market as fast as possible so that they meet, you know, customer needs and, um, and so forth. So that's, I guess, I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, but. no, no. I, I, so I, what I'm seeing is, so if the computer science department said no, you found a way, or the engineering department said no, you found a way. You found a way to build your own curriculum. And that almost epitomizes mm-hmm. what the CDO role takes. If someone says no, it doesn't matter if it's the business or technology, you're going to find a way. 
Um, so I, I think that's a, a unique skill set. You know, the pace of change is frenetic, Heidi, in our space. How do you personally keep up? And are there certain um, podcasts or people or books that you read and follow? So I have started to listen to your podcast, Cindy. Um, Thank you, Heidi. Because, uh, <laughs> you, you, uh, you, you have brought an amazing um, group of data leaders uh, to the forefront, and they have great perspectives. Um, I see a lot of common themes amongst us, which is great, but I also see some nuances that that I love to think about and maybe take back to how we're looking at things. I um, will fully admit I do not do a, a lot of, you know, business type reading in my free time. Um, I play tennis. Oh, <laughs> I good. Cook. I like to travel. Um, and I, I need that like big separation between I, I go like I go hard Monday through Friday, and I do not turn my computer on on the weekends. And good for you. And I try not, yeah, I try not to respond to emails. And I've gotten better at that over time. But I, I really need that like clean break. Um, one of the things I mentioned improv in the degree programs that I'm starting to see for data science, like undergrad and master's degree programs. So. I'm in a management um, training program through Hearst right now, and we had uh, a couple weeks ago um, these actors who do improv comedy, and they brought us in and spent two days with us doing all sorts of amazingly fun um, exercises and improv. And so I'm reading this book. So the one, the one exception I will make is generally I'm like a people magazine reader on the weekend. <laughs> um, there's a book that I'm reading and it's called getting to yes. And, oh, and the yes. And okay. is in quotes and it's, it's called the art of business improv. And it's by an author named Bob Coolhan. And the idea is, and it's, I think it's actually, very appropriate for a CDO role because um, going back to the big rocks and the focus on a few things, it is so easy to get distracted in this job. There's so many data problems to fix. Yeah. What do you chase and first? you want to be able to do them all. Right. What do you chase first? And it's so hard to hire right now. So your teams are, you know, People have like there's attrition going on. It's really hard to hire new people and you got to watch out for burnout. So how do you say no <laughs> to things that can be distracting without saying no? So this book called Getting to Yes And really talks about how you can change the, the way you're conversing with people make sure they know that they have been heard and let them know that although you might not be able to answer their immediate need or solve their problem specifically the way they're asking you to solve it, you hear them and here are some other things that you're doing to kind of tee that up for the future. And, and it is, it's, um, I have this book, it's sitting on my desk. I also have a post-it note sitting on my monitor to remind myself to try not to say the word no. And because it's really easy to say no, because you want to protect your staff, you want to protect your people, you want to make sure that you do a few things really well and you achieve milestones. And so that, that's the one book, you know, that I, that I am reading now. Okay, well, I will definitely check it out because also, one, I'm an avid reader, but I love the book Getting to Yes. So now now this twist, yes and, I'll have to check that out. But Heidi, I have to ask you, so you also, you like to cook. Favorite dish? 
Oh, I'm a big dessert maker. Right now, sort of on top of mine, strawberry rhubarb pie. Oh, there you Grandma's go. Grandma's recipe. Okay, yes. Grandma's recipe. Homemade pie crust, not oh. the store-bought. <laughs> Got to make the pie crust yourself. Yes, same here. So how did we not know that about each other? So I'm going to send you my, my pie crust recipe. And um, I recently learned how to do creme, creme brulee because my son gave me one of the burners for Christmas, blow torches, the mini blow torches. Yes. So we'll have to swap recipes. That's a great dessert. Yes. Well, Heidi, it's been one. Too. Yeah, it's been wonderful having you on the Data Chief. I always like to end with a question and you can choose depending on how you're feeling today, either something in the last year that has totally made you laugh out loud or if you think about what are you most most grateful for? Wow. Um, what am I most grateful for? I would say the... I am, I am actually, this is probably, I don't want to go down a political path. I am very grateful for living in the country that we live in yeah. and having freedom of speech and being able to hear lots of different viewpoints and, and our ability to be able to express ourselves in any way, shape or form. Yeah. Yes. We are very blessed with that. Heidi, thank you so much for being on The Data Chief. Thank you, Cindy. 